tell us first a little bit about yourself. What's your what's your name? What's your background? Well, my name is Chris Gobo, and um, background in football. Uh, but before football, it was me, a young guy from this region of Ottawa. And uh, right now, I'm working in what we call a health camp, radiation protection bureau. And uh, grew up in this area. Got into football. Um, I was doing okay in football as a player, and then I had a severe knee injury, and I luckily now, I see luckily, uh, that I got into coaching quite young. So I was head coaching in high schools and in midget leagues at high levels here at about 21. And then uh, at 25, I had an opportunity to go coach in France. And uh, luckily I got into a pretty uh, good level, Division One in France, uh, and fell in love with coaching in Europe. Just the, the, the it, it's not just the coaching, there's the culture of seeing another country, living in an experience. And from my first time in Europe, what I loved is when you play football at a high level in Canada, or any high level sport, the fun of the game loses, starts to diminish with the higher you go up. There's politics again, all of the off the field competitiveness, uh, the brotherhood is not as tight, it's just more business oriented. But right away, when I came, one of the first things when I went into Europe, I went in as coaching a uh, midget team that I won a Ontario provincial, provincial Championship. We got to go and play uh, three teams in Holland. And what I noticed right away there, I got an inkling. I ended up staying there to help them for four months. Um, how close the guys were. It was like um, a real brotherhood, a real club. You know, these guys were fighting to keep foot. It wasn't just football handed to them. It was, they had to fight to keep their clubs. Even the big clubs had, you know, it was a possession. It was an ownership. And these guys were proud of their teams. And I was refreshing from somebody from North America. So I fell in love with that right away and ended up doing a little stint in Holland. When was this? This would have been in 1992. Uh, yeah. So then I came back, I continued coaching here, but I always had a, it's not something I thought of, but it was always in the back of my mind in Europe. And then I would hear of certain guys going to coach to Europe and there'd be a, like a jealousy inside of me. I'm like, wow, I'd really like to try that. So I had an opportunity with some, through the University of Ottawa, they were looking for coaches. So my name was put forward and I ended up getting the, as I was speaking a while earlier, I ended up getting the job in France, in Lyon. And uh, it was this little scrappy club from a uh, really uh, inner city part of Lyon. It was a really tough club, but they had a chip on their shoulder. They were really fun to coach because all the French, we played in the southern France, there's a lot of money in southern France, so we'd go into like Cannes and Nice and these places, we had this little ragtag bunch of, you know, guys, and it was it was a really fun team to coach, so, not just the football part that was fun, it was getting to know the French culture, but as all the other teams I found out after, that brotherhood, it was just, it was addictive, you didn't, you wanted to be part of that, obviously, it's a very addictive man, it's a very addictive man thing to want to be part of a club, and when you coach in Europe, you feel part of that, you, you see it, even if you're not, as the coach is involved, obviously, nor should you be, you see that around the guys, and it's just, it's just what you want to be around, and that's, anyways, what I like to be around, that's that team, I mean, you get into football because you like human beings, or else you're going to play tennis, or something, because you can't not like human beings if you don't play, if you're going to play football, or be around football. So that was France? Yep. Now, you went on to coach uh, in other countries as well. Yeah, so so from France, what happened is I came back home and then I got a job with the Ottawa, uh, with Ottawa University here in my hometown. Mm -hmm. So I took that up. I didn't go back. I went in France for two years, but then I got the offer to coach at Ottawa U, so I came back coach at Ottawa U. Um, and then I got a, an offer to go coach in Switzerland about two years after, and we worked it out with Ottawa U because the seasons were opposite. Mm -hmm. So I could come back just in time for the training camp. Their championship ended and I just... Two days later, I was in the plane coming back. So I did. Uh, I, so I decided to go to Switzerland. After I was in Switzerland for a year, which was an amazing experience. Again, that seeing that brotherhood and stuff. I'm saying, okay, it's not just Amsterdam. It's not just Lyon. It's mm. got to be your European, right? And it's that club mm. thing. So after I came back from Switzerland, uh, funny enough, my father was uh, looking on a website, the European Federation of Football website, and back. In those days, because I've been out a little bit, used to, every used to, everybody used to apply there for coach. Players would put their names there and teams. It was like a recruiting center. And a, so my dad was looking for information on me. Ended up seeing this team in Oslo. And the description in Oslo, to this day I'll always remember, the description that the Oslo, the Vikings had written, my dad read it and he goes, that sounds like what Chris would like. You know, that's, that's his, he's a no-line coach. The Vikings were looking for that. 
they're looking for this, this, and this. And my dad told me about it, but before he told me about it, he ended up contacting the team. So, the, well, I got a surprise when I landed back home from Switzerland. Uh, I spoke to the president of the team, uh, only Peter Eichenhog, at the time. He told me a little bit what they were looking for. Reading description, and after speaking to uh, OP for the first time, right away I knew it was a perfect fit. So, my, my start was a little bit in Holland, went to France, from France went to Switzerland, and then from Switzerland ended up in Norway, mm -hmm. in Oslo. Now, so your dad was basically your agent? Yeah, my dad, I went <laughs> unknown. He didn't ask for any money, so that's a good part. It was no percentage. This was back in uh, the winter of 98, mm -hmm. going into 99. Right? Exactly, yeah, it was, yeah. Christmas 98, it was around Christmas. I was home for Christmas, so it was around 98, December 98. Yeah. And then you arrived in Oslo when? I arrived in Oslo probably, I spoke to them, and I think one month later I was on the plane. Yeah. I think I arrived around January 20th. Um, arrived at the airport and then they, they put me through a, uh, they still say it's not an initiation, but I still believe it was an initiation <laughs> to see if I was going to end up staying. They made me walk down a ski hill. I was dressed in a three-piece suit with patent leather shoes and ended up sliding halfway down the ski hill. So that was a good experience and right away that first night it was kind of like they had a yearly meeting to assess the club, not so much the football but the club aspect. Yeah, this was the board of the club? Yeah, it was the board. Staying of the, in the cabin. Exactly. The it was like a resort. It was near one of the ski hills and we that night they were making decisions and um, I really liked the respect they gave me, the way they treated me fairly, right away got a good feeling. Uh, I liked the, the best mix for me because it mixed with my personality. Mm. I saw very serious people that wanted to win, but were looking to do it through a fun way, not just throw everything to the business side and forget the sport, or the other way. They were serious, it wasn't just to goof around and mm. not worry about winning. They wanted to win, but they wanted to do the right way. Mm. And uh, I sensed that on the first night. And there's been times in my life where you meet people and go, oh, they're that type of person, that type of club, and then a week later, oh, that's not at all what I thought. But the Vikings were exactly, to this day, were always what they advertise is what I got. They and were who you thought they were. They were who I thought were, good and bad. <laughs> they were exactly what I thought. It was, and it was it was the right fit. It was the right time, right fit for me, mm. and I think for the club. Mm. Two years before that or two years after, it might not have been worked that way, but just at that moment, they were looking for a communicator, which is one of my strengths. Mm. I have weaknesses like every coach, but one of my strengths is treating people fairly and being communicative. Mm. And my background is a line coach. That's when I was first certified. That's mm. when I played. And they had just this raw monster. So it was bigger than most CFL teams. And it was mm. concurring size-wise with NFL teams. So it was like hands and, you know, like putty in my hands. They are all eager. They wanted to learn. Uh, the whole team was like that, but there was, that base is that offensive line, and we dominated because of that offensive line. But that whole mentality that I learned to love from the Vikings and still do from this day, from the Oslo Vikings, was saw in that first meeting. And that was just a club I met. I only met like there, in the board. There was probably three player representatives. Mm. Right away, I had a, a gut feeling, and that gut feeling stayed through my through three years. And I mean, I've been back to Norway 15 times in 15 years, so it goes to show that obviously yeah, something was uh, something worked for me. Yeah, something clicked. <laughs> something clicked, yeah, because um, I still have very close friends there. 99 and 2000 were the, the first two seasons you were there. Yeah, that was full time. Yeah. Do you remember them as? Do you remember specifically things from 99, specifically things from 2000? So you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what was the good things that went on in 99, for example, your first season that you remember as, as memories. Yeah, I um. When it comes to the Vikings, I have very vivid memory. As you get older, you forget a lot of things, but I'm noticing with the Vikings, I guess because of such positives, mm. I have a lot of vivid memories from the Vikings for some reason. I guess that's because I hold them close to my heart. Uh, the 99 season was fun because I was new. Mm. And I walked into this club that had 120 members. We had pra a team one practicing on one side, team two practicing. There were set coaches at every position. Mm. We had a lot of uh, national coaches, which I was really happy to see because it's important to have mm. nationals involved. It's only going to grow and it's better. Mm. Um, everybody I was working with, I was getting along. So the beginning was very good. Mm. Um, I could form discipline easy. They weren't reacting badly to my discipline. They were taking it the right way. And again, that comes back to me saying how lucky I was inheriting this club. It wasn't anything I did. I inherited, I walked into a club that had started to learn how to win mm. and were just ready to do the next step. Mm. So it wasn't because I came in. It's just whoever next coach I think that would have fit in properly was inheriting this club that was eager to win. Mm. So when a team is eager to win, they're going to be more receptive. They're also not going to have as much patience with you, but they're going to be more receptive to start. And, um, the first couple of games, I was so impressed again by how the Vikings would come together as a team. You know, being a North American and hearing all these Viking stories, and when I was 
coaching teams and I was visioning these Vikings out in the field, right? Because these guys just came together and you know, nicest guys in practice field and you get them in a game and something happened. You know, they went as the berserkers or something. They just, they would, it was but controlled. They had a good, um, our joke back then was controlled violence. Mm. They, they just had a good atmosphere. So the beginning of the season was just saying, yeah, I'm in the right place. You know, and seeing the team grow. And what was hard back then is right away you had to play some of your tough. So we played in the Norwegian League and then we had to play in the Euro League. And right away we had one of our toughest matches against Kronberg, a Danish team. And the bad thing about Euro League is you lose, you're out right away. So you play one game and it could be, and it was my second game coach in Norway. And that was a game that we were losing. We were playing a very good quarterback. David Luna was, uh, no, it was, I forget. Ken Soul. That's it. Mm -hmm. David Luna was a linebacker. So <clears throat> he was an amazing, he was known. He had played for Aix en Provence mm -hmm. and won like a, a, a national championship with them. So they had a very good team, but to this day, and some might not like hearing it, they were a better team than us at the time. They were older, they were a little mm -hmm. bit better, maybe better coached. Um, but our guys just stuck together. It was just, and we played, and then we had a, kid that came over from the Trolls and I had just walked into this big rivalry between mm. the Vikings and the Trolls and Adam at the time had left the Trolls to come play the Vikings mm. and the guys were starting to get used to him you know he's still a ex-troll right? and he ended up making a catch on third down that if he wouldn't have made we wouldn't have won yeah. that game and I think of that someday still today if that catch doesn't make how does that how do the Vikings look after that you know don't we would have been out of the Euro right away um, our imports played a great game but it was just to see the Norwegians just decide they weren't going to lose. Right? Rare you see that in football, you see teams worried about, but these guys just decided they weren't going to lose. So we ended up being Kronberg. And we played in the Norwegian League, which we were built to play Europe, so there was some easy Norwegian. But which was fun because sometimes you play at high levels and your younger guys, your less experienced guys, never get to play. Never get to play. So when we would play small, not weaker, but I would call them smaller teams. It was quite fun to play guys at other positions or guys that weren't playing much. Call guys up from team two so they could play. Um, and then we ended up going to the semi-final for the uh, Euro, which is to this day one of my favorite football games of all time, is against Ross Kilda down in, Denmark, uh, down in Denmark. And that's where I saw the modern, what I called, the Viking became a European football strength. I, I saw it in that game. We uh, ended up being Ross Kilda. The game was a little tight at first, a little nervous. And then we were lucky with a, uh, I still say Sean Payton stole my idea, but we got a nice short kick to start the second half. Then in the second half, we just um, we just blew him out of the water. I remember that game also specifically because we had very two very probably some of the best in Europe. And, um, I'll say in national, we had Nikolai Aslaksen, which is still the best European player I've ever coached, and we had Frederick Nunn had a, a, a Swede national that had played the NCAA. So we had these two running backs. They both get hurt from this game. So I had to count on our DB, Howie Innes, that was a little bit older, and I had ended up brought, brought in just to help me kind of coach play, and he ended up rushing for 310 yards in that game and two interceptions on defense. So, And he had been injured before, so it was hard for him because he didn't feel like he was contributing. And in the first game, he was healthy. He ended up almost uh, singing. Doing the whole thing? Yeah, doing the whole thing. I mean, you know, he was that spice that opened mm. up other things, uh, which I was always proud of that year, too. We had a national quarterback. We're playing Euro mm. with a national. And Dennis. Norwegian. Dennis, yeah. yeah. So that was also that was nice to see it was nice to go up against you know american quarterbacks and just yeah, my norwegian kid here in the way yeah. then you you played london o's so then we went to the final after beating ross killer we played against the london o's and when i showed up on the field i very rarely as a coach you say you're going to lose it's not what i thought but when i saw the london o's i went oh boy this is this is like i'm gonna have to coach this game to keep it close and see what's gonna happen that's your first theory when you see possibly strong they had 11 players that had played for the london monarchs the year before and weren't on their regular roster they just started playing for the euro which is okay it was within the rules and they had some of the biggest guys i've ever seen on defense and our guys were looking at it i got to try to divert from it and i told you know we, we talked for the game and the guys went out on the field and played they played above their heads. We ended up losing that game 12-6. Uh, yes, it still scars me. We ended up losing 12-6, and uh, coaches always complain about refereeing, but in that game, it was um, it was some special refereeing. I mean, the winning touchdown, the referee on their side high five their head coach after. So there was little things like that, but like I told our players, if we would have scored one or two more touchdowns, you don't let the refs get in. So it was a good learning curve for the Vikings too, that you're not always in control. And the refs are going to be good and bad, and they're going to make mistakes at times too. But uh, that game and that 
bus ride home was devastating because we had after years you look back and you say oh my god we were the little team that almost won the european championship and we only lost 12-6 but i don't know how we could have played better we we played above our heads and we, i mean the london o's were after the game their coaches and their most experienced players including some professionals that had played for the london monarchs at the time of the mm -hmm. I, it was world no it was nfl europe it had become yeah. nfl europe at that time too um, they were speaking to us because we you know, talked after the game and they couldn't believe our just the talent and the will and they couldn't believe the size of our line and how well it moved and yeah so that london o's game is probably one of the things that's hurt me the most in my life but it's funny enough with time it's probably one of my fondest memories yeah yeah so and that, he won the Norwegian championship as well as yeah, that we, year yeah um, then and very often in Europe you'll have a coach or a player come in stay for a season move on to something else you chose you chose to come back what, what happened there well I chosen to come back way before hmm. I'll, I'll explain it this way when me and Oli Peter I spoke in the president of the club at the time I said that I don't want to come just for a year. Mm. So, I mean, obviously, if I don't do a, bad, a good job, I expect that you fire me. Mm. But what we taught from the very beginning is so I want to come in. Within reason, let me do what I want to do. And when it doesn't work, I'll be the first to admit to it and walk out, or you fire me. So we joke. But well, my plan was to at least be two years. And I said, OP, give me two years, and we'll be where we want to be. Yeah. Now, things went better the first year than we expected. I didn't know what I was going into. Uh, so there was never even the off season. There was no talk about me or mm. coming back or not. It was always planned. Mm. We obviously after the season talked just to address, you know, Chris coming back and was yeah, it was, mm. I was living here full time, going nowhere. Um, I, to this day, I probably would have stayed six, seven years. But after the second year, I got a really, really good job opportunity uh, mm. with the uh, with the University of Ottawa, which I couldn't decline. I mean, I was mm. there, I was a young man. I was starting my family. So eventually, I did have to go home. So it. My stay was uh, cut short. Mm. But that, that second year, you went to playing the Euro Cup, as it was called then, mm -hmm. the Euro Bowl competition, which the Champions League or the mm -hmm. highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you remember from that? Well, I remember uh, the competition was one step up. Mm. We had um, we had a little bit better of a better team, uh, but we were playing higher competition, so. The first game when we played Stockholm, um, I call it like a boxer's term, got punched in the mouth a little bit. We were yeah. a little bit, um, we were a little bit surprised by them. Uh, one of the first times there was some ref. One of the strengths of the Vikings the year before is when the referees would make mistakes or we'll say mistakes, the team wouldn't react. They would just be, uh, and it was the same we had was next play, like good or bad next play. Uh, but something had. There was a couple of plays in the Stockholm game where we kind of were a little bit. It was a higher level, it was harder. Lower levels, you make mistakes, you can catch up a little bit, right? And uh, we we had played a lot of games dominating a lot of people because we had built ourselves up. So when you dominate 60 nothing, 70 nothing, when you get into a tight game, sometimes it's hard to just mentally stay in it. So that game, our team played really hard, um, but we didn't have an identity yet. It took us to have, it took us some more games to find our identity in the second year. And, um, and then we played, uh, after that, we played Aarhus mm. and uh, down in Aarhus. And that game we lost uh, by one point. Mm. And uh, that game was probably the game, I'd say, in all our Euro League games and Euro Cup. And mm. that was probably one of our worst games. Even if we lost one point because we really left that game on the field, there's things yeah. we could have done. And it was just, we should have won that game. To this day, I still think we were better than them. Then when we played Aarhus the second time, we ended up beating them in Oslo. When we went to play Stockholm um, in, in, in Stockholm, the Mean Machine, we lost 21-20 on a missed uh, extra point. We didn't lose because they missed extra point, but it goes to show we had, yeah. we were losing. We came back, came back hard. So it was a little bit hard on everybody to lose because we missed an extra point. It's not the kicker's fault. It's just again, we would have scored a field goal two minutes before we wouldn't have needed an extra point. So um, and that Euro Cup is tough because as soon as you lost one game. You were, as soon as you lost two games in one game, you're obviously out. So um, even though we showed that we could have won that round, it was kind of a learning mm. thing, and the future had looked right at that part. Mm. The thing that also was a big surprise is uh, our, our Scandinavian league 
part of the Euro Bowl is it's supposed to include also the Turku in Finland, mm -hmm. the Roosters, which is a big club. Uh, uh, Turku, Tr Tr Trojans? Or? Yeah, Trojans, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. Trojans, yeah. They had um, decided not to play in it, but all their players came and played for Stockholm. So we also, it was not all the players, they had two of their twin tackles that are famously known big twin guys that both played offensive tackle. Uh, I think they had 12 or 13 guys that played for the Stockholm Mean Machine. So it was kind of, when we played Stockholm, it's almost like we were playing a combination of two really big football clubs. So the fact that we stayed with them and could have beat them, you know, and it's easy to say when you don't win that you could have, but we had the potential to beat them. So I was proud of our guys. So that's the way that Euro, we didn't go as far as we wanted in the Euro that year. But again, our plan was to take Euro one step mm. and then see if we should go back down one or continue in the Euro. Mm. But the problem in Europe is, it's not a problem in Europe, but it's, it's a fact. The more successful you are, the more expensive it is. Mm. So it's very hard to stay competitive at the European level for a long time. It just will drain your club financially. Mm. And you also have to watch what you're doing to the young kids when it comes to that. Because if you're putting everything up here, you're not taking care of your foundation. So mm. that's kind of the mix where the Vikings were in 2001. Mm. Now, uh, you went back home, you coached uh, CS, CIS uh, football yeah. for Ottawa, but you came back to the Vikings. What's the story there? Well, like I said, I'd go back to, I made a lot of close friends with the Vikings, yeah. ex-players and stuff, old, the older the older people. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, I basically had, anytime I traveled in Norway, I basically had 90 friends, all the players, and it was, it was very nice. So I would go back here once in a while, and I'll remember this day, one of the most involved people with the Vikings and has always been, and I was living with him, my first name was Willem Lay. So Willem, me and him one day are having, uh, as you do in Norway, we're having one or two drinks. And uh, Willem says, you know, they were rebuilding at the time. He says, it'd really be nice to have you back. And I said, well, Willem, it's kind of hard. I'd like to too and everything. He says, but what would it take? And we started off in a conversation of just joking around. And joking around, then I realized, wait a minute, I work in the federal government. I can ask for a leave of absence. And we just started like that. Two days after we had signed that I was coming, it was one of the freakiest events in my life where I'm not thinking of going back to Norway or coaching mm. Europe. And two days later, the plans are made. I'm coming with my, uh, I was gonna, my girls came to live with me, my daughters came with me. It was all planned out, everything was great. So uh, I took a leave of absence from a year from uh, Ottawa U. Mm. Uh, sorry, from my, uh, I left the GGs, the Ottawa the football team, and I took a leave of absence from my, my work. Uh, and then I came to coach in Norway for a year, and the Vikings at the time were rebuilding. Yeah, because that was a very different yeah, setup, I, at least yeah. from what you had back in 2000. I, I left the Vikings, well, I didn't leave the Vikings, that's another right way, but when, when I originally went with the Vikings, it was at the height of their program, meaning mm. they had over 150 some, just at the senior level, I think there was 120 licensed people. Mm. And then we had to make their Euro roster who could potentially play on the team, we had to make it 100, you had to supply 100 names, mm. this is in 99. And we actually had to like work at yeah because there's gonna be 20 or 30 not on it so that's that's pretty impressive for a, for a city like oslo in europe so anyways when i walked into the vikings in 2000 it was a complete um change they had they had told me about it but it was still a little bit of a shock mm. because when you leave somewhere for 10 years you think wrongfully oh i'm gonna walk in a little bit into the same situation but we probably only had 30 some odd players uh there was one or two assistant coaches uh, it wasn't the same it was still the same team but it was a transitional period there was a lot a lot of young players a lot of potential but it was it would have taken and what we're seeing now and i saw it there two to three years to get back to a level of you know competitiveness high level as we were expect as we were all uh, expected after being 99 um, and from then on, after I, when I came back, I had to come back for professional reasons again. But it was, the plan was a short plan anyways all the time. But from that, the Vikings kept going. I was proud to see that they every year have done a little bit better and are sticking to a good, not selling out. The easiest thing is to try to sell out and always go for a year or every year, but you can't do that. You have to build, build, build. And when you have your shot, you take it, but you don't, when it's not ready, you, you gotta be patient and you hold on to it. So, um 2010, you were back for a year, coaching or for a season rather. Yeah. Um, that means you've seen Norwegian football and you followed the Vikings because you have a lot of friends there, so you probably followed the team 
to this day. Mm -hmm. What's your um, impression from from the first two part of it until now? What are you thinking of what you see? In a positive, it sounds funny to say, but in a positive way, I didn't see. I, I saw a growth. Mm -hmm. um, what I liked is I saw a growth also not just when I was there it was basically three clubs mm -hmm. it was us and then it would be the eyes vault and then it would be the third team would be the trolls mm -hmm. and after that other teams had teams but it wasn't at the same level mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. because of intent or talent it just wasn't the same size of club yeah. when I went back in 2010 obviously because the Vikings weren't as strong but I saw a little bit I saw the national players being better mm. I saw a really good growth and what really surprised me really surprised me was the if I take the U19s or U13 in 99 compared to 2000 night and day that was the biggest difference mm. you saw the growth of the sport which was really beautiful to see when you see the young guys playing better more mm. better coached you no know, more knowledge of the game they, 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 like I don't think U13 was that big back in 99 mm. there was only two or three teams that maybe had it when I came back it was crazy it was, it was really nice to see how that was that's the thing I take back from 2010 to nine, basically nine years to 2000 was the growth of the younger mm. the younger uh, like I said the younger club the youth clubs the you, you coached in in France Holland um, you know a lot, a lot of years ago that that's a given fact but Holland uh, France and, and Switzerland what could Norway and Norwegian football learn from those countries? Do you have any specifics that you see? Well, I think the other countries could learn a lot from Norway, actually. Um, it, what I find in the other countries in France, um, it was very competitive. They got so competitive between the clubs that it became off the field, and that hurt them. And there was a, a time in Norway in 99 to 2000 that was starting to happen and from what I'm following from seeing it's not as bitter it didn't go where I maybe I thought mm -hmm. that's one thing I hope Norway tries to understand that if all the clubs don't get along and grow this sport together there's no future mm -hmm. there's no future you can pardon the description you can try to kick the crap out of each other on the field mm -hmm. but you gotta work together between clubs there's I mean it's ultra competitive and it's not always going to be fun to work together and it's not always going to be easy but I, I just like that to continue in Norway because when I say what I see from other clubs what I saw is the bad that happened in these other places mm. and it's not been infiltrated in Norway from what I can see and I hope that Norway always tries to work at that it's not perfect in Norway by any means but it's not as bad as other places so it's like a pendulum I hope they just don't start leaning over to the side of being ultra competitive off so, so okay so focus on making your club better but keep the bigger picture of the league uh, in absolutely mind, right? yeah because mm -hmm. you can have the greatest club but if everybody else folds you're playing you're practicing all the time you're not playing games yeah. so there's there's it, it, if i was asked by noaf or some you know, what, what would you think i i obviously here was the same thing invest in your youth invest in your referees uh educate your coaches mm. uh but have more communication through clubs. Mm. Find what your common goals are and work on those. And like I said, between the white lines, knock yourselves out. But Norwegian, Norway is different because of the way the population, from what I can see as an outsider, the cities are far removed. In France, we were playing four or five clubs of cities with one million each within mm. two hour rides. Mm. So I find even more important in Norway, not remote, but distance between clubs, how important they have to learn to work together and really promote that. Mm. This uh, this year, 2016, uh, is the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Vikings. They've been around since 1986, which also makes them one of the oldest, uh, two oldest clubs in uh, Norway. You've been with the Vikings uh, for several seasons. You've also been part of that trip. Uh, for what, 15, 16, mm -hmm. 17 years actually. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> let's not talk about how long <laughs> no, that no, is, no. but, but um, can you tell us a little bit about what's your impression of the Vikings? You know, what do you appreciate? What, what, what do you see for the future of the Vikings? Well, what I appreciate about the Vikings is, uh, as I said before, in, in the 
that club from the first time I saw it, from the first time I walked in and met some of them and then it just kept growing was how close and how knitly, how close knitly they were bounded together. Mm. Um, they weren't the best at everything, but they were definitely the best club that I had ever been around at any level mm. for wanting to play for each other. Mm. Um, which also mixed with my attitude is they wanted to have fun doing it. They wanted to enjoy the process. They wanted to win. They wanted to win at all costs. They were all too competitive, but they wanted to do it their way. They wanted to win. And uh, some of the events of just being around those guys are things that I'll never forget. That it, it, I, To this day, I would fight for any of these guys. They're the closest people I've ever been to. That what we went through in 99 and 2000, the good and the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly, a lot more good, was brought me into that realm and uh, it's not always easy as an outsider because you're, mm. you're visiting but I really felt part of the Vikings. I still do to this day. I really felt part of the Vikings. I really feel like it's my club mm. and you don't hear that from a lot of import coaches. They always feel a little bit, you know, oh, yeah, it's my club but mm. I, I really feel like I'm part of the Vikings. You know, I, it's, it's become my club. Not my club and ownership but I'm part of the club. Yeah. I, it's, I get along with these guys. I love these guys. What I've seen is a team that has fought to a club that has fought to stay together through the ups and downs in football, club football, you're always going to have peaks. And after those peaks, you're going to go down. And it's going to get worse before it gets better, then you're going to climb back up. And they've always scrapped. And I have to say that about every Norwegian team. It's not just not just uh, the Vikings, but the Vikings, because I've seen it, scrapped, fought to stay together. I've had some hard times, the good times, and just that bond that you see with the players that I saw was also with the, the people around it. Mm. Um, so the, the future stays, if they keep always that brotherhood, that sense of ownership to the Vikings, that, there's always gonna be potential there. It's how that potential is handled. But following now where I see they got all these youth clubs and the new field is just incredible. They're blessed to have it. I mean, I know I sound old, but I know the new guys playing there don't know when we were practicing like uh, in fields and <laughs> rugby fields with mud up their ankles, you know, the old stories, the old guys. And I have a special bond because one person that became a very close friend of mine is Henrik Dahl. Henrik Dahl is actually one of the guys that started the Vikings. Mm. And I remember before we played in the final in 2010, the national final, we were down by Frogner Park and we were on the field. And Henrik was looking over and I said, what are you thinking right now? And he goes, I used to live there with my parents and there's an apartment and I remember, this is the night before the national championship and Henrik's telling me the story how he remembers sitting there with a piece of paper in 86 and going, yeah, we'll call ourselves the West Side Vikings. These are the players. This is what we're going to do. And a lot of those guys are still around. And that's impressive. So I have a special bond because I wasn't there, but I keep hearing stories of the birth of the fight. You know, two times you're around someone, you know the actual genesis where it started, you know, in an apartment, and it was right by Frogner Park. So it was one of those moments like you'd see on ESPN or something. Um, so I know the history of the Vikings well, because it's been drilled into me. And I've seen, followed from far, been involved close. I've seen the up and down, but this team's got a lot of promise if they keep doing what they do and that's their brotherhood and they're sticking together in the, uh, the fight of being a Viking. Chris, thank you so much for uh, talking to us. You're welcome. And um, I know you plan to go to the 30th anniversary of the Vikings. Absolutely. So enjoy that as well and uh, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks for your time.